Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face before, then hi. My name is Molly and I post true crime videos like this every single week. And we're getting closer and closer to 50,000 subscribers, which is insane. So if you like this kind of content, then please do subscribe and switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will notify you every single time that I upload. Anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the case of the Abbotsford killer, which is a very interesting one. The perpetrator in this case was very arrogant. They thought they would never be caught and they taunted the police for many months until eventually their identity was revealed. But before getting into this case, I do just want to say a huge thank you to one of my favourites, Function of Beauty, for sponsoring this video. So as you guys probably know by now, I have been using Function of Beauty's hair care for quite a while and I am in love with their products and how customisable they are. All you have to do is fill out a super quick two minute quiz on the Function of Beauty website about your hair in which you outline your hair type and your hair goals and they will create you your very own shampoo and conditioner. For my hair goals I usually pick things like strengthen, hydrate, lengthen, volumize and shine and you can also pick the scent of your products, the colour of your products and the name that is printed on the bottles. This time I chose the scent Cherry Blossom which is just so lovely and sweet and for the colour I picked purple for my shampoo and blue for my conditioner. I've also been using Function of Beauty's hair mask. I've already tried their hair mask before and I absolutely loved it. It made my hair feel so soft and silky. So I decided to get it again and this time I decided to try it in Function of Beauty's brand new limited edition winter fragrance Isn't She Bubbly which is a citrus and champagne scent. And I think it's probably one of my favourite scents so far. It smells so nice. Again, their hair mask is 100% customisable, as is their body wash and body lotion, which I also use. Function of Beauty are completely vegan and cruelty-free. There are no parabens, sulfates, GMOs or toxins in their products. I've been recommending them for months now, so if you haven't already, go check out my link below and you can get 20% off your first set. So why not treat yourself or treat someone else to some new care products? Christmas is fast approaching and I think these would be a really great gift because you can customise them and personalise them. Once again, thank you so, so much to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. And now let's get into the case of the Abbotsford Killer. So our case today takes place in Abbotsford, which is a city in British Columbia in Canada. It was around 5 to 5.30 a.m. on the 14th of October, 1995. So very early hours of the morning when a 16 year old girl stumbled into the MSA hospital in Abbotsford. Now this girl was in a very bad way when she came into the hospital. She was covered in blood, she was stumbling around, she was constantly passing out. It was obvious to the doctors and nurses straight away that something very bad had happened to her and that she needed medical attention immediately or she wasn't going to survive. They soon discovered that this girl was 16 year old Missy Cockrell and she had a lot of injuries. She had a broken hand, she had a broken arm, I believe she also had a broken finger and her skull was fractured. And as well as all of that, she was also suffering with hypothermia. Her body temperature was severely low. Due to these severe injuries, like I said, Misty was constantly passing out, constantly falling in and out of consciousness. But when she was conscious, she was able to speak. And she began telling the doctors and nurses what happened to her and her friend. Misty said that she and a friend of hers called Tanya had been attacked that night and that her friend was still out there somewhere and needed help too. So straight away, the staff at the hospital contacted the local police because 
obviously from what Misty was saying, there was another girl in danger somewhere that needed to be found. So whilst Misty was fighting for her life in hospital, the police began looking for her friend, 16 year old Tanya Smith. And it didn't take long for them to find Tanya, although sadly when she was found, she was not alive. At around 7.30 a.m. that same morning, two men were doing a spot of fishing in the Veda Canal when one of them came across the naked body of a young girl led face down in the water and she was dead. So they contacted the police and the police rushed straight to the scene and I think straight away the police were pretty confident that this was the body of the girl they had been looking for, Tanya Smith. And eventually this was confirmed. They were able to tell from looking at a picture of Tanya that it was her. And it was immediately clear that she had suffered a very brutal end. She, like Misty, had also been badly beaten and Tanya had also been sexually assaulted and a semen sample of her killer was later collected from her body. As I previously mentioned, Tanya was completely naked when she was found but it didn't take long for the police to find the clothes that she was wearing when she was attacked. They were discovered, I believe, very close to the canal and they had been like thrown onto bushes and trees. It wasn't like whoever had disposed of them had tried to hide them. They were very easy to find, almost like they were on display. And as you can imagine, this case quickly gained a lot of media attention. This was huge news. People couldn't believe that in Abbotsford, a friendly and quiet town, something so horrific could have happened to two young girls. One of which was already dead and the other was just clinging on to life. So immediately a murder investigation was set up and working together on this case was the Abbotsford Police Department and the Chilliwack Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Together they were looking for a killer. They began searching the local area for any evidence they could find. Meanwhile other detectives were keen to speak to Misty Cockrell who was obviously the only witness. For that reason, the fact that she was the only witness, Misty had to have like a police bodyguard at the hospital with her because it was feared that maybe her killer might try and get to her and finish her off to prevent her from talking. So she had police protection 24-7 and Misty was still in a very bad way at this point. She was still in and out of consciousness but when she was awake a policeman would try to speak to her about the attack and he would record what she said on a tape recorder and after speaking to Misty eventually the police were able to get an idea of what had happened to Misty and Tanya and they were able to piece together a timeline of events from the night they were attacked. Misty told the police that on the evening of Friday the 13th of October so the night she and Tanya were attacked, the two best friends had been to a party in Surrey which is a city close to Abbotsford. So they were at this party and they were having fun but when they were ready to leave the party the two girls got into a car with some friends of theirs and these friends dropped Misty and Tanya back at Misty's house because they were going to be staying there that evening and having a sleepover. They were dropped back at Misty's house at around 12 a.m so midnight but Tanya and Misty decided that they didn't want to call it a night just yet they were having a lot of fun being out and they knew that another friend of theirs was having a birthday party that night which was happening just five blocks down the road and even though it was late at night it was a route that they both knew very well it was pretty close to their high school so they began walking to this friend's house to this party when all of a sudden a man just jumped out of the bushes in front of the girls and he was holding a baseball bat. The girls didn't recognise this guy, they didn't know who he was and the first thing he said to them was quote, do you bitches want to party? And before they even had a chance to respond, this man just grabbed both Tanya and Misty's arms and he started 
like dragging and pushing them through the bushes and hedges. On the other side of these bushes was a parking lot and I believe this parking lot was actually the MSA Hospital Extended Care Unit parking lot so they were right behind the hospital but of course at this time of night it was dark and obviously pretty empty and I think the girls were like concealed and hidden by hedges so there was no one to witness what happened next. The man with this baseball bat began threatening the two girls and he started ordering them both to take their clothes off and Tanya took hers off straight away. She did what the man said, whereas Misty didn't. I think she was just completely frozen out of fear so she couldn't really do anything but after Tanya removed her clothes this man began raping her whilst Misty just had to stand there and watch and I actually read on one source that to try and distract him Misty faked having an asthma attack to try and get him away from Tanya but it didn't work and he just carried on assaulting her. But it was then when Misty realised that he had dropped his baseball bat. As he was assaulting Tanya, he had placed the bat on the ground next to him. And to be honest, at that moment, Misty could have made a run for it. The attacker didn't have the weapon in his hand. He was preoccupied with Tanya. So Misty could have tried to escape, but she didn't. She knew that she couldn't leave her friend. So instead, Misty grabbed this bat and she hit this man across his shoulder as hard as she possibly could. But before she had a chance to swing the bat again and hit him a second time, this man had gotten up and he started wrestling with Misty to get control of this bat. And eventually he was able to get this bat off of Misty and he just began hitting her repeatedly with it. And she was begging for him to stop. She was begging for her life, but he just ignored her and he carried on hitting her. Misty counted each hit from the bat, each blow, and after seven blows, she was knocked unconscious. The attacker probably thought that he had killed Misty, but he hadn't, he had just knocked her out. And hours later, she woke up but when she did she was alone. The man with the baseball bat had gone and so had Tanya, they were both nowhere to be seen and so Misty got up and as we know she stumbled to the local hospital. Thankfully after having surgery and being treated Misty survived this horrific attack but of course Tanya didn't as we know. Whilst Misty was passed out after she was knocked out with the bat, this man continued raping Tanya before beating her with the baseball bat and then dumping her into the river where she would be discovered just hours later by those two fishermen. And it was later determined that Tanya was actually still alive when the killer dumped her body into the canal. She was badly beaten and unconscious but she was still breathing so her official cause of death was drowning. Had the killer just left her like he did Misty there's a good chance that Tanya would have survived as well but he didn't. He put her body into the river. Now Misty didn't find out that Tanya had died straight away. Her family didn't want to tell her while she was still fighting for her life because they just felt like it would have been too much for her to hear and could really affect her recovery. This was her best friend. So initially, Misty was just told that Tanya was being treated in another part of the hospital. Um, and Tanya was in another part of the hospital, but she wasn't being treated there. She was in the pathology department and they were conducting her autopsy. As I just said, it was determined in her autopsy that Tanya's official cause of death was from drowning. But Tanya also had a lot of similar injuries that Misty had. She had been badly beaten around the head. She had bruises and defense wounds on her arms. And they also noticed that she had um, like cuts and abrasions on her back which indicated that her body had probably been dragged to the canal while she was unconscious. The medical examiner also noticed that Tanya had what appeared to be a bite mark on her right nipple which 
obviously most likely came from her killer. So they took a record of this bite mark and they were able to collect a sample of the killer's saliva from it. But meanwhile, as all of this was going on, the police decided to call in a forensic artist named Cameron Pye. And he sat down with Misty, who described what the attacker looked like in as much detail as possible, as much as she could remember anyway. And he created a composite sketch of the attacker. And this is the picture of that composite sketch. Misty described the attacker as being a Caucasian man, probably in his 30s. She said that he had a slim, lean face, a large forehead, and that his hair was thinning a little and he had a drooping mustache. So the police now had this composite sketch of the attacker and they were getting ready to release it to the public when just a couple of days after the girls were attacked the police received a phone call. One of the detectives answered this call and on the other end of the line a man started speaking and this man said that he had driven Misty to the hospital after the attack and that he just thought the police should know. But the police were confused by this phone call because Misty didn't get a lift to the hospital. She walked there after she was attacked. She made her own way there. So why was this man on the phone saying that he had dropped her there? when he hadn't. Anyway, the detective just asked this man if he could come to the police station to give a statement about this, but the man said no. He said that he didn't trust the police, so he didn't want to give his name to them, and then he just hung up the phone. Now, some sources say that the police didn't bother trying to trace this call, whereas another source said that they did trace it, and they found out that the call was made from a public telephone outside of a gas station in Abbotsford called Circle K. So I don't know what's true there. I don't know if they did trace the call or they didn't, but regardless, I don't think the police really thought too much of this call at the time. They didn't look into it too much but it wasn't until later on in the investigation when due to other mysterious phone calls they started thinking that maybe that was the killer on the other end of the line which I'll talk more about in a second but as the investigation continued the scene where the attack took place was still being searched for any evidence and they didn't really find much to be honest I think all they really found was a hoop earring that belonged to Misty and had like broken and fallen out during the attack. The case was moving very slowly to be honest they didn't really have too much to go on at this point. They didn't have any evidence really. But then on the afternoon of the 18th of October 1995, so about five days after the attack, the police received another weird phone call. Basically a tip line had been set up for this case so that anyone with any information about this inquiry could call it in and give this information over to the police. And when they received a call to this tip line that afternoon, Detective Rod Gell answered it and a man started speaking to him. This man said, quote, I know where the murder happened, beside a walkway that runs north and south on a grassy knoll behind trees. And then when Detective Rod asked where he was getting this information from, this man said the following. Just to let you know who I am, Tanya's right the taste it really good. And then he just hung up the phone. The word that was bleeped in that phone call, by the way, was nipple. So this man said, quote, Tanya's right nipple tasted really good. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Tanya did have a bite mark on her right nipple. However, at this point in the investigation, when this man made this phone call, the only people that knew about this bite mark was the person who conducted Tanya's autopsy and the police. This bit of information had not been released to the public, so the only other person that could have known about this bite mark was the murderer. Detective Rod had just spoken to the killer 
on the phone. So immediately the police began attempting to trace this phone call and they quickly discovered that it had been made from a payphone across the road from the MSA hockey arena in Abbotsford and so they rushed straight there but unfortunately they were too late. The killer had already gone. So the police brought in forensic experts to dust this payphone for fingerprints but again there was nothing. But then just a few hours later, so that same day, the killer made another phone call but this time he rang 911 instead of the tip line and he asked the operator if he could be put through to the police and once he was put through the killer said the following Do you think I would be stupid enough to leave fingerprints behind when I make a phone call? and then he just hung up the phone. Now the fact that he was talking about fingerprints in that phone call indicated to the police that he was probably watching them. When they raced to the payphone near the MSA hockey arena, the killer must have been watching them or else how would he have known that they just did for fingerprints? So once again, the police tried to trace this phone call, but for some reason it didn't work. I don't really know what happened, but they couldn't find out where this phone call had come from. Although before they even had a chance to really listen back to the call and look into it, they received another just 20 minutes later. The murderer had once again contacted 911 and after being put through to the police, he said to the operator, quote, are you having trouble finding the killer? And when the operator replied saying, why do you want to provide information? The man on the other end of the line said, I'm the one giving you the chance to try and find me. Around looking for someone else. Before hanging up the phone, the killer said the same thing he said in one of his first phone calls. He said, quote, just to let you know who I am, Tanya's right nipple tasted really good. So once again, the police followed normal procedure and they traced this call to a phone booth just a couple of blocks away from the Abbotsford police station near the Ventura grocery store. So they rushed straight to the scene, straight to this grocery store, but as usual, by the time they got there, there was no one at the phone booth. They spoke to a couple of people, like members of the public, that were near the area where the phone call had been made but no one remembered seeing anyone at the phone booth, so once again, the killer had successfully gotten away. But these phone calls really provided police with an insight into the mind of this killer, what kind of person this man was. This obviously wasn't the kind of killer that would avoid police at all costs because he didn't want to be found. This man was like excited to be in contact with the police. He clearly felt that he was above the detectives. He felt that he was more intelligent and that they would never be able to catch him because he was so clever. He was arrogant and he clearly had no remorse whatsoever about what he had done. In fact, in the last phone call, he was threatening to do it again. He said, I'll be cruising around looking for someone else. But on the 20th of October, the composite sketch of the killer was released to the public. And not long after this, 16 year old Tanya Smith's funeral took place. And the police had to literally watch everyone that attended the funeral because they feared that the killer himself might try to attend. That seemed like the kind of disgusting and arrogant thing this man might try to do. And he did. They didn't realise this at the time, but they later came to learn that he did attend the funeral, which I'll obviously talk more about later. And then at the very end of that same month, so the 31st of October, Halloween night, the killer made another phone call. The killer called 911 at around 10 past 9 p.m. and he described what he did to Tanya Smith. He referenced the bite mark on her nipple and again said that he was going to do it to another girl. And it was discovered that this phone call was made from a phone booth outside of a pub in the area, Gigi Sports Bar. But 
as usual, when the police arrived at the scene, there was no one in the phone booth. But they spoke to a member of the public that was near the scene and they told the police that they saw a beige coloured Grenada car parked right in front of the phone booth just a couple of minutes before the police arrived. But that was all they could really tell the police. I don't believe this witness got a good look at the person using the phone booth so once again police didn't really have much to go on. After this fourth phone call the police made the decision to release parts of these tapes of these calls to the public in the hopes that someone out there would recognize this man's voice and come forward and as you can imagine everyone was talking about this case like I said earlier it was all over the media it was huge news and people were terrified. Young girls in the area were so scared that they would be next. The killer had made threats that he was going to do it again and so no one felt safe because it seemed like the police were no closer to catching this man. I mean it wasn't the police's fault, they really were doing everything they could to try and find him. They were looking at known criminals in the area and interviewing them and comparing their DNA to the DNA samples they had of the killer. Obviously as we know they had his semen sample and a sample of his saliva from the bite mark but so far they hadn't found a match. By this point in the case, 16 year old Misty was doing a lot better and she was back at home with her family, although she still had constant police protection because obviously they hadn't found the killer. And she was visited by another forensic artist because the police thought that now that she was doing a lot better, it might be worth asking for her help again in coming up with a new composite sketch. Because when the first composite sketch was made, Misty was still in hospital and she was still in a very bad way, so they thought that maybe now she would have a better memory of what the attacker actually looked like. So on the 16th of November, Misty sat down with a forensic artist and she once again described the man that attacked her and Tanya. And this was the sketch that came from this meeting. Misty said that it looked more like her attacker than the first sketch did. Soon after, the new sketch was released to the public and the police began receiving countless tips from people who believed they knew who the killer was, who the composite sketch looked like. But there was one man in particular that was mentioned a couple of times in these phone calls and his name was George Evenden. Now I believe George was kind of known to the police. Apparently he was suspected as being involved in drug trafficking and he was also accused of a couple of sexual assaults in the area. In fact two women who had been sexually assaulted by a man picked George out of a lineup and both of them said that they believed he was the guy who assaulted them. Although when George was in front of Misty in a lineup, she didn't pick him out as being her attacker. But regardless, the police still decided to look into George as a suspect in this case and George willingly gave over a DNA sample and a dental impression of his teeth to be tested against the bite mark on Tanya. George was very cooperative with the police to be honest. He was willing to do anything that they wanted him to do and after questioning him, detectives actually began to doubt that he was the killer. I think at first they really thought that he was their guy. They really thought that they had found the Abbotsford killer but now like I said they were sceptical and eventually George was completely ruled out as being the killer when it was determined that his DNA was not a match to the DNA that they had of the killer and his dental impression did not match the bite mark. But what's interesting is that the real killer, whoever he was, had been very quiet during the time that George was a suspect. The police didn't receive any phone calls from him so it seemed like he was hoping they would pin 
the murder on George so that he would get away with it. The Abbotsford killer hadn't contacted the police since Halloween night, the 31st of October. They just didn't hear from him at all. So people began thinking that maybe he had left town, maybe he had moved away. That was until the 17th of February, 1996, four months after the attack on Tanya and Misty, when the killer did something that is honestly one of the most insane things I have ever come across. Like when I read this, I was in shock. That afternoon, the killer made another phone call but this time not to the police. He actually contacted the local Abbotsford radio station, which was called Radio Max. You know when like members of the public can phone into radio stations, sometimes they have competitions and stuff? Well, the killer rang the local radio station on the public line and he spoke to the radio host whose name was Mike. He didn't say hello or anything like that to Mike, the only thing he said was, quote, check the Radio Max car in the parking lot. And then he just hung up the phone. So Mike was obviously pretty confused by this phone call. He didn't really know what was going on. He initially thought that maybe this man ringing had damaged the Radio Max car or hit it and was just too scared to tell him to his face. Anyway, Mike went out to the parking lot and he began walking towards the Radio Max car and from a distance he could see a pretty big object just sitting on the bonnet or the hood of the car. And when he finally reached the car, he realised what this object was. It was a headstone, Tanya Smith's headstone. The killer had ripped his victim's headstone from her grave, taken it to this parking lot and dumped it there. And he had also defaced the headstone. He had scribbled and written things all over the picture of Tanya. He wrote, she was not the first and won't be the last. I'm still looking, you won't find me. And also one day, Misty. So he was directly threatening his surviving victim, Misty. He also wrote on it a reference to Tanya's nipple. So the police knew that it was the killer who had done this because again this bit of information the bite mark on her nipple still hadn't been released to the public yet it's just absolutely insane like i said when i read that i was just in shock because to take someone's life is horrific in itself but to then disrespect and vandalize their resting place and their headstone <sighs> It's crazy. I cannot imagine how upsetting and traumatizing this must have been for Tanya's family. This person, whoever he was, had absolutely no remorse or guilt whatsoever. This was clearly all just a fun game for him. He loved the attention and he loved playing cat and mouse with the police. He thought he was invincible. Just two days after he dumped the headstone, the murderer rang 911 and this was his, I think, fifth or sixth phone call to the police. 911 emergency, if you need police fire and This time the call was traced to a payphone next to Rotary Stadium running track in Abbotsford and as soon as the police had the location, patrol cars rushed straight to the scene. As usual, the killer had already fled, but the police began speaking to everyone they saw around the area. And when they spoke to a young woman, they learned that she actually saw a man using the payphone just minutes before the police got there. This woman was jogging along the running track when she spotted a man using the phone. And she said that she believed this man was probably in his late 20s to early 30s and she also noticed that near to him there was a beige coloured car which matched the description of the car that was seen at Gigi's sports bar where the killer 
previously made a phone call to the police. Anyway, this woman said that after this man finished using the phone, he walked towards the running track and just looked at it for a moment with his arms crossed. And then moments later, when this woman glanced towards the area where he was again, she realised that he was gone and the beige coloured car was just leaving. Unfortunately, this jogger couldn't give a great description of this man because she didn't really see his face that much and of course at the time she didn't think she was looking at a possible killer so she didn't really take note of his features. All she could really tell the police was that this man was approximately six foot tall, he had an athletic build and he had like reddish brown hair. A couple of days after this the police received another phone call but this time from a woman who lived in the area and this woman was very startled and scared because she had just been sitting in her house when all of a sudden one of her windows had just smashed because someone had thrown a wrench through it. So the police went straight to this woman's home and they had a look at this wrench which was on the floor and they noticed that taped to the object was a letter in an envelope and they soon realised that this letter was from the Abbotsford killer. He had just walked up to a random house and threw this letter and wrench through the window. This was a new way to communicate with the police for him. In the letter he claimed to have committed other crimes and he said that he had sexually assaulted three other women and then on the envelope which was a dark blue colour he wrote in block letters quote from the killer. So this was all collected as evidence and sent off for forensic testing and the forensic expert didn't find any evidence on the envelope However, he did find something on the tape that was used to stick the envelope to the wrench. He found the killer's fingerprint, so the killer had slipped up. So immediately, the police entered this fingerprint record into the National DNA Database and the US Criminal Records Database. But unfortunately there was no match. It was crazy and I imagine really frustrating for the police because they actually had so much evidence in this case. They had samples of the killer's semen and saliva, they now had his fingerprint, they had numerous phone call recordings with his voice, they had a letter he had written, they had composite sketches, they had so much evidence but they still had no idea who he was. And I think the public really started to lose hope at this point. They started believing that this case would probably never be solved and that the police would never catch the killer. The police decided to turn their attention back to the tape recordings of the five phone calls the killer had made. Like I mentioned earlier, the police did release parts of these phone calls to the public in the hopes that someone would recognise this man's voice and come forward but nothing really came from this. But the police were just thinking, someone out there must know this voice. They must know who was making these phone calls. And so they decided to enhance the recordings and release them to the public once again. And they were asking anyone with any information about this voice to get in contact with the police. The enhanced tapes were released on the 30th of April, 1996. So just over six months after the attack on Misty and Tanya. And just a few hours after they were released, the police received one particular tip that would prove to be the breakthrough in this case, the breakthrough that the police had been waiting for. This tip came from a woman named Audrey and she said that she and other family members believed that the person who made those phone calls was her son and his name was Terry Grant Driver. She said that it sounded exactly like his voice. Terry's mother, Audrey, also mentioned on the phone that 
Terry said that he had attended at Tanya Smith's funeral and that during a family argument he shouted quote don't fuck with me you don't know me anymore and you don't know what I'm capable of doing. Terry Driver was born in 1965 making him 31 years old at the time his mother contacted the police in April of 1996. He worked for Abbotsford Printing and he was married and he and his wife had two children together. He seemed, to everyone that knew him, just like a normal hard-working family man but now he was a suspect in a murder case. So after receiving this phone call from Terry's mother, two detectives went to his house and they waited for him to arrive home from work. And when Terry eventually got home, the detectives noticed that he was driving a light brown 1982 Pontac Grand Prix a car that is similar to the description of the vehicle seen by two witnesses in this case. Terry got out of his car, he went inside his home and not long after the detectives got out of their car and they went and knocked on Terry's door. Terry answered the door and the detectives explained to him that someone had contacted the police and identified him as a possible suspect in the Abbotsford killer case. They decided I did not to tell him that it was his own mother that gave over his name because, well firstly, if he isn't the killer, that could make it very awkward and difficult for their relationship. But also, if he is the killer, that could put his own mother in danger. Who knows what he might have done to her for identifying him. So the detectives just said to Terry, look, someone has given your name over to the police and we need to speak to you about this case. And immediately the detectives thought that this man's voice did sound very similar to the voice of the killer. They began interviewing Terry and they were just asking him about his job and his just his life in general I think and at one point they asked him what he was doing on Halloween night the night that the killer made one of those phone calls and Terry said that that night he was just trick-or-treating with his kids although they couldn't confirm this and give their dad an alibi because they were very young at the time. Towards the end of the interview the detectives asked Terry if he would be willing to come into the police station and give over a DNA sample and his fingerprint or if he would come and take a lie detector test and Terry Driver said no, he wasn't willing to do that. So of course this was an immediate red flag for the police because if someone was suspected in a murder inquiry and they knew they were innocent, they knew they had nothing to do with it, why wouldn't they want to cooperate with the police and give their DNA so that they could be ruled out completely? Anyway, Terry said no for whatever reason and the police left his house and I think later that same day they rang Terry and asked him again if he could come in and give his DNA samples. But once again, he refused and he told them that he would ring the police back the next day. The police later learned that that same evening after speaking to them, Terry Driver contacted his boss at Abbotsford Printing. I believe they were quite good friends and Terry wanted some advice from him about this whole thing. He explained this whole situation to his boss and he said that the detectives wanted him to go to the police station for questioning and his boss said, well Terry if you aren't guilty then you should do as they ask, you should cooperate with the police. So the next day Terry rang the police back as he promised he would and he told them that he was not willing to speak to them until he had gotten a lawyer. And Terry had a specific lawyer in mind that he wanted, his name was Mr Jack Harris and Terry was just waiting for him to become available and he said that sometime soon his lawyer would be in contact with the police. So whilst the police were waiting for this, waiting for Terry's lawyer to get in contact, they decided to have a little look into Terry Driver's past and his upbringing just to try and get a better idea of who this man was and whether or not he was capable 
of committing such a horrific act. Terry Driver was born on the 27th of January 1965. He had three siblings so he was one of four and according to a book I read about this case when he was born Terry had some form of brain damage. As we know Terry's mother was named Audrey and I don't actually know what Terry's father was called all I know about his father is that he actually used to be a police officer, which is interesting. Anyway, Terry was, I think throughout his entire childhood, very badly behaved to the point where his parents literally couldn't manage his behaviour themselves. And so when he was just five years old, he was put into a special care facility. During the time that he was in care, his parents got a divorce and apparently his time in the care facility was, quote, troubled. I don't know in what way it was troubled. That was literally all it said online. I'm guessing he was probably abused there in some way but as Terry got older his bad behavior just continued and got worse he got more and more violent and he enjoyed being violent towards other children and people and also animals he enjoyed hurting animals. Eventually as he entered his adult years Terry pursued a career in printing and he soon married a woman that was 10 years older than him I believe and they had two children together and they decided to raise them in the city of Abbotsford. Which brings us back to where we were in the case. So after speaking to his lawyer Mr Harris Terry Driver agreed to speak to the police and kind of cooperate. I say kind of because everything had to be on Terry's terms. Terry said that he would give the police his fingerprints but he refused to give any other form of DNA. So for example his saliva, he would not give that to the police. And he said that he would only give the police his fingerprints if they promised to destroy his fingerprint record immediately after they had finished using them. Now I just want to quickly recap and run through the DNA evidence the police had of the Abbotsford killer. So they had his semen sample from where he had raped Tanya Smith, they had his saliva sample from the bite mark on her nipple and they also had his fingerprint from the sticky tape that was used to stick the envelope to the wrench that was thrown through that woman's window. Now I believe that the public knew that the police had a sample of the killer's semen. I think that bit of information was released to them. However, as I've said a couple of times in this video, they didn't know about the saliva sample that they had retrieved from the bite mark. And they also didn't know about the fingerprint on the sticky tape. The only other person that would have known about the saliva sample and the bite mark would be the killer. But what the killer wouldn't have known was that the police did have his fingerprint from that sticky tape. So the police realised that that was why Terry only agreed to give his fingerprints because he didn't think that they had the killer's fingerprints to test against it. He thought that they only had his semen and saliva, which is why he refused to give those samples of DNA. So anyway, on the 3rd of May 1996, Terry Driver arrived at the police station with his lawyer and they took his fingerprints. And after examining his prints against the prints they had of the killer, they discovered that it was a match. 31 year old Terry Driver was the Abbotsford killer. So Terry was immediately arrested and taken into custody and news of his arrest soon circulated around the local area and people that knew Terry were shocked because as I said earlier he just seemed like a nice normal friendly family man not the kind of person you would 
expect to also be a cold-blooded killer. Driver decided to deny his charges and he pleaded not guilty, meaning that the case had to go to trial. The trial began in September of 1996 and by this point the police and the prosecution had collected a lot of evidence against Terry Driver which they presented in court. Firstly, as we know, his fingerprint was a match to the fingerprint that was discovered on the sticky tape from the letter and wrench and within this letter he confesses to the attack. Secondly, they had taken Terry's dental impressions and his teeth were a match to the bite mark on Tanya's breast and his saliva also matched the saliva sample that they had of the killer. He also matched the semen sample they recovered from Tanya's body and I also read from one source that a fibre found in Tanya's eyebrow during her autopsy matched fibres found on the floor of Terry Driver's car, indicating that after he attacked Tanya he put her unconscious conscious body into his car, drove her to the canal and then dragged her into the water where she would drown and then later be found dead. Now Terry's defence team could not deny all of this forensic evidence they had linking him to the crime. There was no way they could say that Terry had no involvement. So instead they decided to take a bit of a weird approach at explaining the evidence against him. They claimed that Terry wasn't actually the one to attack the girls with the baseball bat. They said that the girls were attacked and beaten by another man who had just left them to die in that car park and that sometime later Terry came across both of the girls on the ground and they were unconscious and they said that Terry noticed that Tanya was naked and so he decided to rape her during which he bit her nipple. Terry claimed that whilst he was raping Tanya he could hear her breathing but then when he was finished he realised that she had stopped breathing and that she was dead and he said that he just panicked. He realised that his DNA and his semen was going to be found on a dead girl's body and so he decided that he needed to dispose of it somehow. So he put Tanya's body in his car and he drove to the canal and he just dumped her there, probably hoping that the water would wash away any evidence on her body. It didn't. He also claimed that he then drove Misty to the hospital just like he did in that very first phone call and I don't know why he said that because like I said earlier, he didn't. Misty walked the short distance there. It took her a while and I believe she collapsed in a garden at one point on her way, but she eventually got back up and she made it to the hospital herself. So Terry tried to claim that he wasn't the one to attack and beat the girls with the baseball bat, but he said he did rape Tanya and then dump her body into the river. But of course, no one really believed believed this at all. If this really was what happened that night, it doesn't explain Terry's actions after the attack. If that really was what happened, why did he call the police countless times and taunt them and confess to the murder and rip out Tanya's headstone? I think I mentioned this earlier, but he even attended Tanya's funeral. The funeral was recorded and he was caught on tape there. That's how sick this man was. And I'm pretty sure during the trial, he said that the reason he attended her funeral was to say sorry. That was his way of saying sorry for what he did. At one point during the trial, I believe Terry's defence team tried to blame his actions on the fact that he had Tourette syndrome and OCD. I'm not even going to spend much time on that because 
of course a lot of people suffer with those disorders and they don't do what he did. Before Terry's trial ended, his surviving victim, Misty Cockrell, very bravely took the stand as a witness and she described her memories of the attack and when asked if she could see her attacker in the courtroom, she said yes and pointed to Terry Driver. The defence team opted for Terry to be tried in front of a judge rather than a jury and so the judge was to make the final decision on whether he was guilty or not guilty and when the trial came to an end in October of 1996 a year after the attack the judge found Terry Driver guilty of the first degree murder of 16 year old Tanya Smith and the attempted murder of 16 year old Misty Cockrell. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years so after 25 years he would become eligible for parole which I believe is just next year 2021. Terry attempted to appeal his sentence in 2001 but this appeal was rejected and eventually in a separate trial he was convicted of two more sexual assaults which he confessed to in the letter that he threw through the window with the wrench. After the trial and everything Misty Cockrell began doing a lot of volunteer work for an organisation called Youth Against Violence. I believe she did a lot of public speaking and as well as that she went on to get a bachelor's degree in sociology. Misty also eventually went on to start her own family she got married and she had a daughter and she actually named her baby girl after her best friend Tanya and that is pretty much it for this case that is the case of the Abbotsford killer a really really sad one but a really interesting one as well as usual please do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments before i go i do just want to give a special shout out to the members of my patreon page thank you so 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 much for your support guys if anyone else wants to become a member of our little patreon family then the link is always in the description box of my videos i also just want to say thank you once again to function of beauty for sponsoring this video remember you can get 20% off your order with them when you go through my link in the description box. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!